have several questions, and maybe I'll start with the first one. It came up when I just uh, looked at your presentations. You were talking about uh, reducing the size of robots, making them backpack able or stuff like that. And on the other hand, I just looked at the picture from Katrina, and you had a lot of rumble, <coughs> big lines, big rumble. How do you think a uh, robot could uh, navigate there? Maybe overcome a stone that is twice as high as the robot is? a big problem there. Well, I think with Katrina, because of the wood debris, it's such as something that, that a rescuer is going to be able to traverse. I mean, it's just showing you different types of, of debris fields that are out there. The one that showed the house with the door with the, the different layers that you could actually come in and maybe there'd be void spaces that were there, that's more applicable where you can't get a rescuer in. But yet for somebody traversing over the top of the piles, I just don't see a robot doing that. Yeah. We've got canines that are going to do that. We have rescuers that will do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll carry them into that point and then we'll deploy them when we find openings that we, that we can't get into. So they won't, it wouldn't be going over all that stuff to get to where it needs to go. We'll bring them there. And then once we get there, uh, if I can't climb in the hole, uh, I, I need to send a robot in there. So you think inside of the house there is uh, not much room? Oh, they're probably, yeah, yeah, that's why we, we're, we're setting up the, the test standards to hopefully address that. I mean, not every robot's going to get over everything we need it to get over, unfortunately. Um, that's, just, that's just the way it is. But if we can have them overcome most of it, uh, it's a lot better than we have now. But I think that's also the importance of having it small enough to backpack in, is that if you are traversing across <coughs> debris fields like that, you can carry it, and like I said, when Doug gets to the point where he can't go in, you can deploy it at that time. This is also regarding a similar scenario which you addressed, which was uh, the floor. You said you want to throw a robot inside and you see these, uh, these holes, right? And you're told by, uh, by structural engineers that you can't go inside it. So uh, my question is basically, should um, should the cost or the simplicity of the robot be, uh, come into play when you're designing, designing this robot, when you're discussing it? Simply because if you throw inside one out of one of six robots that you guys are carrying that, that are heavy and expensive, and you can't recover them back, uh, then perhaps for the next few houses that you visit, you don't have the robots. Mm -hmm. So would it, would it, it, from that standpoint, would it make more sense to have a, like a 120, 150 really cheap small robots that can, uh, they just pose maybe, and you can, you can order them the way you want, they're easily available? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's what we're trying to go is, is right. developing it to where you get to the point where they become disposable. You know, right. until we get to that point, we have to look at some other mechanism to recover them. Okay. And now we're looking at the tether. You know, and right. because it's the only way you can get it back out. Yeah, Gabriel. My question is the obvious question. Uh, my side. Can you speak up, please? My oh. My question was, uh, for you, what would be your ideal interface with the robot? Would you like to speak to it? Would you like to be able to touch it and interact with it like that? Do you want to have something in your hand? I think for, from our standpoint, I think would, your track is very good. I think if we have all of the smartphones or some sort, if we can just do it through there, then that's a very good place to start. So everybody has it. With, with, with light conditions like they are at times, you know, using some, something with a screen. I've used virtual goggles before, you know, with a, with a controller, and it does make it kind of nice where you don't have to battle the ambient, you know, sunlight. So I think that's a possibility too, is maybe that type of capability where you could either use a screen, a handheld device, or maybe a goggle that would, you know, you could use in literally all light conditions. Every mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I asked a similar question to Japanese respondents. And the answer is <coughs> simplest is best, and they want to keep one hand free. One hand operation, if they have a free hand, if something fall down, or uh, umbrella grip, mm -hmm. so the yeah. simple one hand operation is better, and also the voice, or something very simple way, or intuitive way, the uh, Japanese responder for such interface. Well, the goggles can be some sort of option, because yeah. like the, uh, like, the camera the pole search cam that we showed um, that has a system in the box where you can 
actually loop through the screen. The shroud. Okay. Yeah, the shroud where you can actually make it dark. So, but a handheld device that's widely acceptable, and nobody else to go and buy additionally, to, like a phone, would be uh, very good. I can tell you what we don't want is what, like on the <coughs> Motec robots, they have this board, and it's got must have 20 different levers and toggles and everything else. Mm. So a lot of times you have to hold up this lever and go like this to be able to, you know, to lift your arm and you do something at the same time. Actually, I had a video that I didn't show where the news media was there overlooking the shoulder of one of the bomb techs on a call. And it was kind of comical. He was trying to show me, he says, well, you have to, you push this lever up with this finger and push this lever back with this thumb and you move this lever here with this hand and this makes it go this and that. And it, it, so it takes a long time to really get proficient at that system versus you know one that, that like you were talking about that maybe you just had a lever one lever could go back and forth side to side and push button and you know, click maybe a finger here and push with the thumb there all in one hand the rescuers have actually talked about this in disaster city with the nest uh, exercises <coughs> about trying to standardize to uh, one remote controller that literally would work with all the applications because every robot has a different controller so if you're going to try and simplify it and make them you know, so much standardized, it'd be nice to literally have a template that they'd all work on. It'd be very similar so you don't have to relearn different consoles when you deploy different platforms. Well, uh, so I was going to ask for the, the robots that you evaluated, have you tried uh, any uh, snake robots? Have you seen anyone that actually would? We, we use a snake at uh, Disaster City. Mm -hmm. Haven't done it through debris, but we've actually penetrated through a wall in the, in the one building that collapsed. Yeah. They're real good for all the different applications. They go up, up pipes, like drain pipes go in, you know, that type of deal. Yeah, they work very well. Um, they're, they're long, they're narrow, uh, they can get places where others can't. So, so, so what's the senses of those carrying the, is it just a camera or the carrying the Just to be clear, you're talking about Satoshi's? No, that's not what I was thinking. You're just talking about Oh, okay, okay. Oh, so they're talking about Satoshi's. Right, okay, okay. Which is the camera. Right. However, Anything that goes through any sort of borehole that they can put into the side of a building, that's not unreasonable. That might not be unreasonable. We could call a snake. Maybe it's segmented snake. Maybe it's something else. Long, thin robot. Uh, in our last exercise, we remotely deployed one of those snakes from a canine. Uh, just sent a canine in with a pouch that was remote release and deployed a snake. Yeah. So what we should really talk about is what is the suite of sensors that they want as opposed to what have they seen. Color video for sure. Absolutely. High quality color video. Yeah. Yeah. Um, IR. Variable illumination. Light. Yeah. IR. Light, light is huge. IR. Yep. Look for heat source. Motion detection. Absolutely. Uh, sound. Yeah. Yeah. Sound. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Stereo sound. Directional yeah. sound. Yeah. That'd be nice. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> we want it all. Yeah. yeah. Truly. Yeah. 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 Well, see if someone well, like your connect is that. So, you know the connect? Yeah, we yeah. know the connect. All right, the connect was what everyone, was the first thing, when we first put that borehole in the side of the step fields under the stairs at the that portable cup, the very first thing everyone did was pull the connect off of their desk that they were just about to put on their robot, turned it sideways, put it on the pole, mm -hmm. and stuck it in the hall. It fits very nicely. The rotation came from doing this, which is fine, except that it's still the search yeah. came sure. Not our team, but it's a good start. What you got out of that, and we should show some of those images, was you know the barrel roll, 3D image, 3D overlaid with color, so you can see, you can make out the victim, you can make out the step goes very well. The potential for measurement of distances between stalactites and stalagmites was inherent in it. That's the advantage. So, except for the range, I mean it is dark inside these voids. That's the good news. Aside from the range, it's a good start. Getting past that first corner, or even not getting past that first corner, just hardening that solution is an improvement to the search cam. It goes no further than the search cam, but it gives a measurement capability and orientation, which is really important. When you're looking at the inside of that void, you have no idea which way it's going. And so they know they're up. They know I want to drill over there. The question is, how far over there am I supposed to drill so I don't come down on the victim? Um, I'm also interested in the uh, uh, 
sense of touch, uh, remotely being able to touch something like assisting with the force feedback, is that useful? Is that typically used in I, I think if you got to the point where you're looking at maybe victim retrieval, you know what I mean, with, with that type of a touch where you don't crush, I think that's the point, but I think that's a little bit farther down the road probably than where we're probably at right now. I think right now we're looking at search and attack, you know, essentially with these things to be able to be a mechanism for our team to deploy, to be able to avoid space, sip human size, to get in there, do a search, identify a victim, maybe make contact if it's got a tether, you know, we've got unlimited power, we've got communications, we may have five, we may have a lot of other things to where you can establish, you know, that link. Verbal Absolutely, yeah. And then and then we start looking at deploying rescue teams and where we're going to... But even during the detection phase, do I mean, you, as such a rescue team, do you actually use your hands to feel things? Is that something you do or not? Just so much as a digital Oh, as in your searching? Yeah, as a search. When we're, when we're diving, we would... Obviously, you're using your hands because you can't see. It usually zero visibility. Pretty much with the robotics that we've seen, I really have come into an environment where it's been really zero visibility because we have some way of illumination or IR or, or there's some way we're seeing, visualizing. You know, when you're you talking touch, <laughs> there was no chance to Maybe we are right now and very honest. My question is related to uh, operating control units as well. So, um, I think there is a step that you want more and more features but also standardize uh, control units. So this is a major thing. what they mentioned with the robot manufacturers for a long time and from what I've heard and heard them talk about they adamantly refused to you know that jaws that joint uh, whatever it is jaws you know because that was one of the things that jaws called for and they ab absolutely refused to go to any type of a standardized uh, controller box because they, they do not they say well, ours is proprietary and everybody's afraid to give up their proprietary information to somebody else to come up with the standardized box. And so I don't think that's going to happen. But what I, what I, I think they are probably trying to work towards is a more simplistic box without all the, the, the levers and things like that. So I don't know if that answers what you were. Tells me that the problem is behind the proprietary solution. That's a big issue. Yep. There is a robot under development called the Advanced Features, Advanced EOD, the support its disposal robot system, Aegis. That is based on JAWS 4, which is kind of new and I really fully baked yet. You know, so the government is going to put a lot of money behind a, an interoperable robot built from scratch to have a mobility module, which has its own architecture in it to be plug and play with a manipulator, with an interface, with a radio comms system. So everything gets a little more expensive. There's controller modules on each of the pieces of components, but they are supposed to be able to be more competitive in terms of opening the market for any other solution. It's uh, you know due in a year or two. So it might be the beginning of the future of that. You know who's making Whether it's gonna catch on or not is debatable. What? So the mobility is being done by Macro USA. The manipulator is being done by RE Square. That's all I know. Um, well, okay, so case of stay up so the um, firstly with regard to scanning and stuff, so if a few people have mentioned like the connect and like chucking it in a hole and, and getting a map from that. Um, what sort of occlusion do you do gen generally get? So like imagine if you throw a device in and it's got a little scanner on it and sort of it looks around into the room. 
unless it has some sort of arm to lift it up or something, it's probably not going to be able, well, if there's any rocks in the way or something, that's going to be in shadow, and so you're not going to see around that. Is that um, a realistic problem? Would you then need something even on a small throwable robot to like lift the sensor up and do a pan around? Or would it be enough to have it at ground level, just sort of looking around, tilting backwards and forwards? Well, I think the option is nice because you know you can throw it in there and it can just end up behind a hull, <coughs> and then it's useless. Well, I mean, ideally it it would Unless be able it to it top. would be able to move, um, so it would be wheeled or tracked or something, so it could move around. But it would be a lot simpler to create a robot that doesn't need to lift something up. That can I mean, there's like a retractable antenna kind of thing, perhaps. Cool. That's the way I would think of. It. Like you just have a little device on top of the scan, it goes up, looks around, like periscope, pretty much. Like, um, could be useful. No? Well, and I think what we've seen at Disaster City is we've seen some very high tech scanning capabilities on very unruggedized platforms. I think Doug and I have talked a lot about this. about taking high tech made from Japan and integrating it into another platform that's hard, you know what I mean, to, to get the best of both worlds. And it need, it'd be neat to see that kind of interoperability within the community where if you have something that, that works really well, if you can get that attached to a platform that would allow you to move it to where you want it to go, some human sized void, maybe you can bring in some kind of a scanning capability, some kind of a cube or something and it could deploy out. I mean, to me, you can meet, get the best of both worlds. And then these sort of sensors that use um, infrared transmitters and stuff, any, if you try to use them outside in bright sunlight, they just die because they get saturated. How much of your work is actually done in, or do you ever need to scan a, an outdoor area, or is it always generally deep down inside a hole where it's dark and it, it would be a Yeah, normally it's going to be, yeah, 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 time. most of the time it's going to be dark. Um, outside scanning we can do with air bots. Uh, we can do it ourselves visually, um, or get on a higher platform and then do it ourselves. But you know, it's, we need it basically in dark, pretty much low light or dark environments. Because understand how our system works is we have canines for deploying, right, on a pile. If we have cracks, we have sunlight, we have human scent coming out. So most of the time that canine's going to hit on that spot, it'll be confirmed. If there's a crack we can stick an object like a snake into, you know, we're going to stick down. We won't necessarily have to do scanning that way. So. Okay, and then just two other questions. Um, you, you mentioned, well, obviously depth perception is a problem when you're remotely operating a vehicle. Has anyone tried to do stereo cameras, like not in the sense of computer-based stuff, literally just two cameras on the device with two um, separate feeds in goggles so that you can... Look to the left, look to the right? Uh, that, or not even, just to get depth perception from Perfect. looking through two different video feeds. I was actually to get depth, right? so, so at our baseline, yeah. two yeah. cameras looking at it so that you could get a feel for them. Literally just putting where your eyes are uh, on the device. Yeah, I haven't seen it. You know, two cameras. Uh, yes, uh, one of the um, <coughs> dual manipulator shoelace tying deals. Uh, I've been using that, it, it, you know what they're saying is that's conventional, relatively speaking, conventional technologies that go into a human processor. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of people trying to do stereo to navigate and stuff like that, but it's just to feed the operator a little bit more depth perception. I guess the question is, are those things, why aren't those things catching on? Is it because you can't wear them for more than 20 minutes, which is what it takes you to drive down range efficiently, or to do whatever job you <coughs> want? requires dexterity and focus. But it is a, a possible field for research. Yeah, no, it should be absolutely. We, as Robocop, should have a test method that rewards that just so that we can exercise that technical lane and we give these guys the glasses and let them decide if it's working for them. If they only use it for 20 minutes, but that's all they needed was 20 minutes working, fine. We're a very low tech solution to a big problem. It's Generally, fun. with the cameras that are on there now, it is difficult, though. I mean, if, if you go up there, and, it's, and another thing that's very difficult is using the cameras, if you have your claw out here in front, you know, you're, and then you have a disruptor back here, you, you have to really put some sort of a, you know, a little laser on there, a mounted on the disruptor, so that then you can put it down and shoot it, you know, and then put it on the mark, because that's, 
the disruptor is generating way back here, that's really difficult to get a, a bead on, like if you're going to shoot a pipe bomb or something like that and break it open. So that's the application that requires the absolute most precision shooting. Yeah. Or dead or otherwise. Yeah. And, and then last question for from all the search and rescue. Um, with, with regard to the sonar, um, or, or rather the, the trapped person location with sound, is that just a random sort of placement of the six senses and then listening to each one individually and seeing which one is picking up the strongest signal? Or have you tried um, things like um, communicating between the senses and each of them knows what they're listening to and then you could use sort of sound location techniques with multiple microphones to, to detect, well, this one's hearing this sound, this one heard it so many milliseconds later, and you can do directionality and stuff based on that. Is there anything like that done? No, but, but it does have filters that you yeah. can use, and it, it, you do the deploy them, you have digital, you can see the, the readouts for sound, and if you're looking for the sensor that's picking up the greatest amount of, of the sound you're looking for, you know, using your filter. So once you've identified that, you've triangulated a little bit, then you start to, to continue to, to do your grid, make that grid smaller, 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 to you essentially have your point where the sound's coming from. That's kind of a starting point then. Okay. There's just... a lot of human judgment in that. Oh, there is. It's huge. Because it's a highly non-homogeneous environment. Total judgment calls to, you tried to put it on a slab of concrete, yeah. but you had no idea what was going on six inches later. Well, well, yeah, that, that's yeah. what I was thinking, because you could, I mean, put a higher resolution grid of sensors and do cross-correlation and stuff to figure out exactly where sound is coming from, but then again, it could have been reflected or something else, so the actual question I was going to ask is, is there any point in looking into that further, or does sound generally tend to come through any opening and it could have actually originated somewhere completely different? Um, and we're looking more for sound that's coming up through solid objects, you know, I mean, somebody that's able to get down and get a piece of pipe or, you know, something that's, that's allowing sound to travel, you know, we're picking okay. up so that so be sound. So it's going to be transmitted over a large area yeah. anyway, so there's no so point you, trying to narrow it exactly. Narrow the yep. No, no, they're not saying it's, there's no, no we point. Want to narrow it down. Yeah. What, well, yes, but... Points. Okay, but yeah, like through a large piece of concrete, you're going to hear it pretty much anywhere on that concrete and so you, you won't be able to get an exact yeah, well, the sensors idea. are very sensitive so I mean, even, even, if it's, even if it's very similar to the human ear, once those sensors are sensitive enough to um, kind of different, if you see on your screen which one, you know, gives the picture, there are notches on them so you can, uh, you can easily say okay maybe you know, this one has a, maybe just a small nudge or noise but it's higher so you shift according to there. You can also plug in, although the search can is very primitive compared to all these things we're thinking about here. Uh, you can plug in a second set of headset onto the machine, onto the yeah, two sensor, people. and then so two people can listen. Just so, just to kind of reduce the risk of one person's human error. That's the judgment part. Yep. That's yep. judgment. Right. So now you think you heard something. How do you tell the people on the pile who have picked a spread based on where they can get to that you put their listening devices down? How do you tell them to move? Where, where do you tell them to move? Well, the sensors are identified one to six. So it says right on the sensor. So once you've identified which sensor is picking up, picking up the greatest amount of sound, you then reconfigure the sensors around, building away from that point to see if, if you're narrowing that scope or by putting one to the other side of where that you, you that keep one. triangulating around until you get to where you're on top of the sound. But so there's no localization in that. There's no incremental motions in that. Maybe it's not incremental because they can't actually there's something between the two spots that they choose, so it's partly. I mean, this is, this is the, way, the way you switch the sensors is actually very analog, if you, so to speak. If, if you have a the one that picks up the noise most, is the sensor, <coughs> and then number six is the furthest point away from the sound, then you would take that and use the sensor one as the center point, and then put the exact opposite side of sensor one, and then shift the other ones. Especially playing golf with the sound. Yeah. So Something like that. Trying to get closer and closer, make the box smaller. But if you had localization involved, you can make more incremental steps. You might be able to learn from the last signal about the environment that that listening device is looking through, different than this one, and close in much quicker. Apply the filters more intelligently. Uh, one, one comment for the uh, a sound search. Uh, in Japan, uh, 
especially like in uh, Kobe earthquake, many buildings collapsed, and sound or voice is only the uh, information to identify the victim location. But to hear the victim voice, everything should be silent. Construction, digging, everything around the radius 50 meters or so. So that's the silent time. Degrade the searching performance to other areas. So we have a nice technology to background noise cancellation. It's very, very nice. That's very true because when, even when you're on top of the rubble and you have a person moving, a person on near the heat sensor, and you know, they have, we tell them to kind of kneel because you know, they should be able to shift in their feet. And everybody else, all the public are watching us work. You know, we, especially in Turkey, because the public is very difficult to control, uh, you will, we will tell them to sit down. So while we're talking about sound, noise of your robot affects your ability to listen while you're driving anyway. So you might need to stop, look and listen on occasion. And you might not be listening for voices, you might be listening for someone banging on pipes in some sort of pattern that would be <coughs> sound like dripping. disaster city with uh, I think a couple that were, were autonomous going in doing mapping scanning the where it would go in by itself and predetermined parameter parameters and going in and doing the 3D scan of the room. I, I'd love to see that capability. I just think that that's down the road a little bit from probably the initial baseline or the initial capabilities we're trying to you know get into the robot. I think I'd love to have a, I mean where you get the predetermined parameters and they set it into a hole and, and it would do what you told it to do and it does it by itself. But once again you don't have Tom loss in with radio, you know, I mean, it goes in and it it's going to get tracked its way in and it comes back out. In my opinion, the single best mm -hmm. autonomy you can put on a robot first would be to recognize a degradation in your radio signal, turn around, let your traverse until you have a stronger signal, don't go that way again. You know, survival of the robot downrange <coughs> is probably the best swing thought for autonomy. Um, after that, self-writing, or before that, self-writing, the robot finds itself flipped over through no fault of anybody. It should try to flip itself back over because it didn't light up lost comms in that flip. Um, Centering between obstacles, definitely in tight environments, but any indoor search, have them not have to think so hard about the doorway, just push forward and let the robot push force field through the doorway and don't touch it. Um, I mean, turning it on and off. What's that? We have seen pieces of all of those. Attempts at all of those. Um, but I think you were, you were asking about their interaction with the autonomy. Obviously, they're in control of their system. It should be a set on or off kind of behavior. Adaptive cruise control. Level. You, you decide when the situation is right to turn on cruise control. <coughs> Adaptive cruise control cruise off the guy's bumper, but you know what's safe or not, if you're comfortable or not. Give them choices. Scare climbing behaviors, A, B, or C. 
They'll pick B when they see something that looks B to them. They'll cycle through them all sequentially. They might have a good starting point. That's, that's, that's it. So, I don't know, so, but, so Tessa, I understand that when the robot was sent into the nuclear reactor, it was capable of autonomous control of fluids, but the operators didn't want it to happen <coughs> because they wanted to have complete predictability, yeah, trust me. Even, even though it probably would make it more efficient. Okay, uh, as you said, uh, nuclear reactor twins have some autonomous capability, but typical operator refuse. No, tele, no autonomous, only teleoperation. And was it the flipper behavior that we were doing? Everything should be teleoperation or remote. No autonomous. Right, but that's, that's a training issue. Mm -hmm. That's a side by side. If they knew what that robot looks like when it does automatic stair climbing, it is idiot proof. Mm -hmm. But we just need to prove itself statistically so that they trust it. The force field thing we've seen implemented in the game in RoboCup, it worked beautifully. Stay off the wall, sent between objects, and it came up to some glass and it stopped. And the responder who happened to be behind it said, well, I don't know why it stopped. It looks clear to me, override, boom, right through it. It was plexiglass, it did not get over. But it was a trust issue that stopped it from being implemented well and properly. Okay, another issue, when it comes to EMEs and photocopter drones, we do research on solar coordination for reconnaissance of big areas. The question is, do you have some files or historical data on weather conditions when your uh, work occurred? So you're just sitting in every tower and then expect that weather is fine, no wind, and the drones can fly however they want. And if you tell me weather is most time bad, you can just abandon all this research. Do you have some data on that? Well, I think statistically, if you look at hurricane, the hurricane's going to come through. You're going to, it's going to bring some other weather with it, right? It's passing through. And down, it goes from a hurricane to a tropical storm and a depression. So you may have some residual effects with some wind, with some, some rain. You know, if it's a hurricane event, an earthquake may be different. You know, it may be an earthquake during a time when there's rain. And it may not be. I mean, that's the variable there. Yes, in Japan, uh, we are now uh, combined disaster typhoon and a uh, big earthquake. We are, uh, it's a kind of a scenario. So make any kind of weather condition we can expect. So do you have statistical evidence of history or is it just the wish that I have? Are you talking about water resistance or for the elements? So that the main issue for, for storm coordination is uh, for UAVs. So there's a wind and what's wrong that wind might be like used to on weather. And, and some of the things, one of the ones I didn't get to present was one of the UA, UAVs that was the, the Vectron, the Avenger. It's rated up to 65 miles an hour, uh, geostationary with satellite. So it's it's a bigger one though. Yeah. The smaller ones like the Air Robot, are, are not, they have a much, much harder time with the wind. I think anytime you're looking at a hurricane event though, you can expect you're going to see some wind until it is pushed all the way through. So if it's being deployed by an IST team that's coming in right either before the event, the event's going to happen, they're going to hunker down, and as the event passes, you're going to have residual effects, they're going to go out in the field. So I think there's always a potential, especially with a hurricane, you know, for weather, both wind and, and rain. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, Bob Tech, what about, normally, I just want to check with the information that I have, what is, what is the link for the safety zone, like uh, the distance that the station and the robot and normally how long time that yeah, you have to use the robot for one mission, that kind of thing. How long do we usually use it? Yes. If it's for a SWAT operation, it could be a long time. Because, you know, during the time they're negotiating and talking to somebody, we may, but usually, um, okay, so uh, if, if we're assessing SWAT, usually what we would do is get the robot out, Make sure it's charged up and ready to go, turn it off and let it just sit there. And then if they eventually say, okay, we want you to go in, then you're ready to go. And that could take, geez, I don't know, an hour, maybe, you know, by the time you get up there, especially if the front door's shut and locked, you'd have to get up there and shoot it and knock it open, then go in there and then start, you know, taking your time, looking behind, you know, chairs and sofas and, and checking each room as you go through. So that could, that could take a while, hour, hour and a half. What about bomb take like bomb spot? For just a regular bomb call, I would say it's a lot faster because you usually you have something there. 
and so you go right up there to it. Uh, if you have a disruptor, it's already loaded up, you've already got a plan what you're going to do. You go up there, right up there to it, put the disruptor and shoot it and, and break it open and break it apart. So, you know, the, uh, that, that would be a lot faster because with the, with the SWAT part, you don't really have a plan until you get in there and see what you have. With uh, uh, an IED or a suspicious package, you know what you're going to do. <clears throat> Generally, you know what it, uh, <clears throat> what it looks like, so you, you, you already have a plan formulated. Okay, and what about the radio control for the robots? Because, uh, like the IF, IED, so there are various type of the radio frequency that the terrorists use right now. They use IF, they use mobile phone, they use many things. So what I heard uh, back in my country, what they are trying to do is they do the jamming first. And would that jam our own robot? Uh, do, do you know about this? Well, I have as far as jamming, there are probably 15 bomb squads in the United States that have jamming capability. And that was money that was money that was given to them and to purchase this through the federal government. So as of now, that's, that's it, maybe 15 or 20. You cannot use any type of jamming device in the United States without getting, for, and we actually have a protocol now. So you would have to go to the FBI, then the FBI would have to notify all these other government <coughs> agencies before and then they would all have to say yes, 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 before you could come back to you and say you can use any type of jamming device. Okay. Um, so, so that part is is kind of cumbersome, but it is workable. You could do that. Uh, otherwise, you know, we haven't had hardly any devices here that were set off by you know by RF. So it, it, it's kind of the capability is there, but it's not really right up front being pushed real hard right now. Does Thailand jam? Yeah, we even shut down the, the mobile phone system for that specific area. <coughs> so you usually run your robots on a tether? Right now, what we have, we are using like 5 gigahertz. And that so far, I, I never heard that they have a problem with jamming. But jamming is because it depends on the yeah, terrorists. And start with the radio frequency. Later on, they use that uh, pad on the radio frequency yeah. to talk to the bomb, mobile phone, and stuff. So they do jamming. Yeah, I don't think you could use use RF capability on the robot and do jamming at the same time because you're going to jam the signal on the robot. You'd have to use the fiber optic line. Okay. You can, but it's much more expensive. And usually, no, how, how far that you you think that is the same? Like your station and the bomb, the, the, the standoff. Standoff. Like oh, I think you could go a lot farther with tethered. I mean, if you put a 2,000 foot spool on there, that you, I mean, you could go 2,000 feet around corners and everything else, whereas you couldn't generally do that with RF. Okay. I, I like the tethered part myself. I mean, Spooled I know it's on it's, the robot. Huh? Spooled so, on the robot. What is the from the robot. shot test? This that that you believe that is safe, like 50 meter or 100 meter? Oh, how far do we generally get back? Well, it depends on how big it is. If it's only something small, then you don't have to get back as far. Maybe just get back uh, from here to the, to the building over there and just get around the corner. You know, so you just work around the corner, just go around the corner and goes right up to it. If it's something small, if it's something bigger, like a you know a backpack size, we you, you probably want to be back a little bit farther and around the corner. So a lot of it just depends on the location, you know. I mean, if you're working something right here outside the building, if you got down here and got around, you know, behind this wall and behind that wall, and you know, I think you'd be okay. So, so it just depends on the size. And normally, would you like to use the X-ray machine together to check what's going on inside? Or I, I talked to Ami. They said we just did stop shoot it, no X-ray. Air Force said. We use you know what? I, I think we, a lot of guys have come to the conclusion, you know what they're saying, if it looks like a duck, it probably is a duck, you know? Uh, a lot of times now, most bomb squads that, that I know of, you go, you go down there, if you got something that laying there and it looks like a pipe bomb, why go down there and x-ray it? There's no need to. Just go down there and shoot it and break it apart. If you got something that's really suspicious, 
you know, generally just go down there and shoot it and, and be done with it. And then, and then if it's somebody's briefcase, you go, ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the x-ray part, I think x-ray is kind of taking a step back a little bit. I don't think people are doing x-rays near as much as they used to. I mean, that's my opinion. But why is the question? It's not like they wouldn't like to have an x-ray. That's oh, like yeah. We I mean, could not make it happen remotely using the robot really pods heavy. that they have. Yeah, they really have me. So it was too cumbersome to even think yeah, about doing it over. too timely. Hey, if you could hang a little single-sided x-ray that just went up there and be able to do it, absolutely. They use it every time. Yeah. But as of now, you have to take these contraptions down there. You have to have your film hanging on this yeah. side, your x-ray hanging on this side, and lower them down, and push the button, and hoping it works, and then it doesn't work, and you got to bring it back and try to figure out why it didn't work. And, Pretty soon you say, screw it, just go down there and shoot it. You know? <laughs> it also matters where you are. If it's a military, if it's a border thing versus downtown municipal building, there's probably other overlay of concern. But we need to talk bluntly about the time you can go ahead. Uh, just uh, maybe from your experience, may not relate to the robot, uh, robotics, but we have one problem that's uh, the terrorists, they dig up the wall underneath the the pathway, I mean the road, and they put the gas a bomb and maybe the gas tank or something underneath it. And then once, yeah, the soldier or yeah. whatever passed through, so they just detonated. Any way that we can find that, uh, like clear the road before the time. So I'm sure the, I don't know that because we haven't had that. I'm sure the military though has put up with many of those different types of issues in Iraq and Afghanistan yeah. on buried IEDs. I mean, that's, maybe they have something, but, but as far as state and local bomb squads, I don't think we even have that as a problem and it hasn't been a capability that we need. Okay. Kind of along the same line a little bit, I know that Fairfax did a little bit of work with ground penetrating radar, right? With the ability to look through concrete for a victim on the other side of a wall, uh, probably along the same lines where the military may be looking for IEDs out in front that are buried. I don't know exactly where that went. I know there was something that kind of slowed that process, whether it was the size or application. You don't or, see very far. Yeah. You, they're, they're all better off looking for disturbed earth. And then it moves from disturbed earth to the garbage on the side or something else, or into the culverts underneath, which is why we made a culvert test for confined space. It's difficult. It's not that you want to blow it up or just find it. And what you're talking about is a device that's aimed to kill people. You yeah, know, just aim for a soldier. Right, right. So, but I mean, it's it's, it's but it's intended to kill people, yeah. soldiers or whoever. You know, we're not talking about that now, where we have really had to put up with those type of uh, <clears throat> you know booby trap devices where they're really trying to kill the bomb tech. Let's see. Question over here. My question is related to power. Uh, and we have seen a lot, uh, few examples where army people are carrying the robots and going. What would be the ideal time that they are working, working time for the deployed robot when they deploy? Is there like a new requirement that you have? Like it should work for like two hours, three hours, or? As a duration? Yeah, duration. On battery? Yeah. You know, it's one of the tests that Adams are working with at NIST is endurance. Well, endurance and catch packaging. Yep. So the catch packaging is all about, they have shifts that are 12 hours. They are downrange for 12 hours. You need to walk them downrange with everything they need to be continuously operational for 12 hours. If that means your battery life is 20 minutes, you're sending them down with a backpack full of batteries too. Right? Is that correct? Yes. Pretty much. So it's a trade-off, it's a balance. You know, robot operation time, they might say 20 minutes is acceptable, if I'm just doing a, a hasty search and trying to clear a little void or a room and coming back out, I can put another battery in and go. That's okay. So it's not like, I mean, they have all kinds of different applications. You have to understand that too. So if you had extraordinary dwell time and only 20 minutes of mobility time, they would find a use for that. It would be to emplace sensors to check if buildings are shifting over time. Like, is it going to fall down? The structural engineers want to watch the building over the course of the next few days and the next few aftershocks to see if it's getting worse. So they want to replace a sensor and pull that sensor once in a while for days. What are the, what do you generally encounter now? 
when it comes to long uh, time deployments for rover, I mean like data, so how do you generally do it now? Like you take the third or uh, you actually have like loads of batteries getting recharged all the time? Well, we don't have robots. I mean, that's the problem. We don't, we don't have anybody out, any robots out there. On the research and rescue side? That's what we're here. On, the, on our side, yeah, they do. But yeah. on, that's why we're here. We're, we need your help. Um, and we're asking for a lot. We don't have anything right now land-based. Uh, we have underwater and air-based. But land-based, we don't have anything right now that we're using um, that can meet the requirements that we need. We're getting to the level that bomb squads use robots. If we can use them at the same time, they do, that'll be yeah. We're asking for a lot. I mean, we want, we'd want. we love to have a robot who can do both battery power and shore plug-in with the tether so that, you know, to extend its life. Um, we're asking for a lot. We'd like to have all the toys that you can develop. This doesn't mean every robot's going to use all those toys. But there's, some, there's times where we might just need light and sound only, but have the capability if we, need, if we have the space you know, to put something else on there, like cameras, and a few other things to attach on there to, you know, to make it more usable in certain environments. We don't need all the toys all the time. We're gonna use some of the toys all the time. You know, does that make sense? Um, because so, a, pay a payload may be as simplistic as a candy yeah. bar, energy bar, a yeah. bottle of water, you know, that you're trying to get into somebody to help, you know, I'm surviving the laundry. That's, I think that's what we're kind of looking with the subhuman size void is that tether, the recovery tether. Like Doug said, maybe one that could be detachable. But once again, you kind of remedy the battery part of it, you know, where it would come in and essentially be stationary, you know, inside if you're establishing a communication link with somebody you found. Yeah, like your laptop. I mean, you, you use battery when you don't have a plug-in, but if you have a plug-in, you plug it in. So, but you can use it both ways. That's what we're looking for yeah. eventually. Um, Okay, so urban switch rescue is the hardest part. What is fast, light, and mobile? Bomb tanks, however, bigger, heavier, anywhere from 20 minutes to three hours. Swap maybe overnight, dwell time. If you're in the house, you won't be the same. So what happens with the swap? Do you have like flash research? Do you take it with a and with the power supply, or how do you do it? For long mission, sometimes you have like three, four hours. They hope the robot lasts out. Yeah, you just kind of hope the robot lasts. I mean, you, and on the screen, you know, you have an indicator of your battery life. So if it gets, if it looks like it's getting down that low, then eventually you're going to have to bring it back out and, you know, and put it in the battery. And, and you, you're always going to have a couple spare batteries there, but you would have to bring it all the way back out, especially if you thought, you know, if there's somebody in there with a gun, you wouldn't be able just to walk up there. But you're going to, you're going to have to bring it out and bring it to an area of safety, swap the battery out. But once you get going, you know, the battery life is, I don't know, I was going to say it's probably a couple of hours. I mean, you should have enough battery life on it if it's fully charged to go in and search a typical building. So, so I've got a question actually more for um, Bellet. When you mentioned that some, a lot of your rescues are actually in the terrain outdoors, um, where, I mean, guess, have, have you been looking at using um, drones with thermal sensors and the like to do your? Uh, your, your people find you mentioned you use thermal cameras. Do you have any comments on that? Usually, if you have a thermal camera, we people get lost out of the terrain. Uh, we usually work with the military, and then they'll just look at the bird, helicopter, and then you can just do an aerial search. Um, it is like, for as far as we're concerned, we have the equipment and the skill to just uh, do this <coughs> research by ourselves, but the priority would be for use of it. Because the, thermal, because the thermal imaging will solve a lot of problems, unless the person has died. Right. So, um, but so this is no real interest in, because the thermal camera is getting much smaller, they could actually go on backpackable drones and walk in sure. and throw it up. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting I'm, I'm against it. It would be great, but if there were to be a priority, then that would have to be on the But I mean, you going on a terrain with a backpack and throwing it something, and you can just see with that how we call the military helicopter. Great. Yeah, we use thermal energy every day in our normal in our normal job. Fire for a variety of reasons: search and rescue, um, just finding fires hidden in walls, whatever. So, yeah, we use it. I mean, constantly, and that's a that's a huge asset to us. Because in that sense, like the like the Prometheus thing I showed, if you can throw something, you can just map an area, and see it. Uh, that would be a, a great luxury. 
may uh, just uh, comment or ask you guys comment also that uh, rescue robot is more in the rough terrain, very rough terrain. Why uh, bomb check robot? What what my experience is? It didn't really define really like a um, manipulation of the robot itself. Like what 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 it needs? Just okay, you can climb up the pavement or stairway or that kind of thing. But same like on the rescue robot mission. Yeah, we have a lot of debris and stuff. Can I conclude like that? Do you understand my question? Can we conclude that bomb tech doesn't need super mobility while rescue robot requires high mobility? I don't know. It's true. Yeah, that's very true. Yes. It's, not, it's not true to the limit. Bombs constantly go up the stairs and stairs and they need to do it well. Okay. Just remember, all right, so you know, we should talk about timing very specifically. Right? The opposite of how long can you last. How quick can you get the job done? Mm -hmm. The reason for robotics for these guys is because the robots are going to make them more effective, <coughs> and more efficient, and safer all along the way. So let's talk about um, let's talk about vehicle-borne IEDs. Maybe a sort of simplified environment, mobility-wise, because the vehicle got there, so the robot should be able to drive roughly the same terrain. It's up in the, next to a building, so it's rather improved properly. But what we're seeing is, and we're going to try to formalize this, what we're seeing is the reason why they're still putting on those padded suits is because the robot failed. And the robot failed because it was either too hard to get the damn thing downrange because there were some cars in the way or some stuff, or when they got downrange, they couldn't do anything useful with it anyway except look in the windows because they couldn't reach in because they had no dexterity whatsoever, or no elegance to them to be able to reach in and dexterity. So, what we've been hearing is, we might be able to actually set the time <coughs> limits for every phase of a vehicle-borne IED response. Phase one, rapid assessment, get down range. Maybe the guy's already suiting up. Get down range while he's suiting up, circumnavigate the thing, get situational awareness, break the windows, look inside, Try to clear the robot, try to clear the vehicle. If that doesn't take seven minutes, the robot has failed. I don't know what seven minutes is, but let's just say there's a number that they have in mind. And then they're gonna put the bumps suit on and go down and get it done, because they know they can get it done by hand. But we're trying to stop that. So seven minutes might be our limit. So that test method will then have a threshold of performance that you will understand very clearly. If you can't do this task in seven minutes, your robot hardware, your robot interface, isn't sufficient to do the job. But the good news is it's only about some coordinated control manipulators, some good remote situational awareness using 3D you know, uh, scanners to understand the environment, maybe some good interface. We can do this, is my point. But don't get too hung up on asking them questions like, how you use robots now, because the robots aren't answering their needs. So we, we, that's what we're trying to do, is actually improve the robotics that they get exposed to. Then we can ask them how they would use it. Yeah. So, any more questions? I'd like to thank our responder panel for sharing this.